dissolved metals. That's why you've come here. That's why I'm here to talk. How many of you have not heard me give this presentation? There's a few of you, not many. So most of you have heard this before. So bear with us. This is the review. Those of you who haven't, pay the most attention and look around at all the other people who have heard this presentation because they will help you when you forget this stuff. Because I promise you, you will forget it if you don't do it all the time. But luckily, every region has an ambient monitor who goes out and does this stuff every month and is basically your expert on it. And they may not know all the answers about why you do a certain thing, but they know how to do it. So if you need to go emergency sample, like, oh crap, I need a dissolved metal sample, I need it now. You need to do two things. You need to go talk to your ambient monitor. In fact, you should probably take them with you and have them help you take the samples. Or not. Why do you shake your head? Because our ambient monitor is off doing his well, typical sampling. Well, so I say in an, ideal in an ideal situation, you grab them and take them with you. Yeah, so How, not available. As best you can. Anyway, talk to your ambient monitor. You can do that. We all have cell phones. And call, someone else, I'm going to put you on the spot, Connie. Call Connie Brower, somebody like that. Or basically call your, your regional office supervisor who knows to call Connie Brower and others to make sure you know what. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. Or just somebody, even just me or somebody else, to know how, what kind of samples you need to take. I'll Do you need you dissolved? Chris. Huh? I'll tell you to call Chris. <laughs> and call or Chris. Yeah, Chris Vinaloro. You guys, you, everybody knows him. Um, because they can tell you kind of the, the why. The, they can tell you the why, why you need to take a, a total arsenic as opposed to dissolved arsenic or both. Just go ahead and collect both. So there's the why, there's the how, and then we'll worry about everything else after you get your results. So anyway, I'm going to give you sort of the, the hands-on. Here's the, here's the how to do it, and we'll talk a little bit about the why and, and open it up for questions because I'm sure there'll be some. So get it. So, one of the reasons why is that the, the um, standards have changed. I think everybody in this room has heard this. Starting in the beginning of 2015, we went to a dissolved metal standard. Um, so whereas everything we did before was based on a, a total unfiltered dissolved uh, metal sample, uh, now it's different. And the standards are actually a little bit different because they are often, many of them are hardness based. So, so we started this process uh, and, and with, you know, water sciences section, figuring out you know kind of what we wanted to do. We prioritized. There were uh, 51 sites that were relisted by the EPA. We didn't think they should be listed. The EPA relisted them. <coughs> we have completed 28 of these 51. There's actually it's more like 48 because some of the stations are sort of combined. But um, we co we completed 28 of those. The ones that were AMS, the ambient, you know, the state. Ambient <coughs> monitoring system sites. The coalitions, they didn't. They did not complete those. So we may be doing those. So this is the key to you ambient monitoring folks. We may end up going to the coalition stations ourselves if we can't convince the coalitions to go sample them themselves. That's still a work in progress, but just keep that in mind, guys. We may end up going to some of their sites to collect dissolved metals so that we can have the data for assessment come next cycle. So we've done that. So we've, we've got a good set of data for metals. Go ahead. So how do you collect a dissolved metal sample? So basically it revolves around getting something that looks like this. Every time you do a dissolved metal uh, sample, you need a kit. We call it a kit. And this is something you'll get from the lab when you guys go do your lab tour later on this, this afternoon. Um, I'd like for you to ask. I don't think I'm going to be joining you. But be sure and ask about where, who, how, and what these dissolved metal kits come from. I will tell you that uh, the receiving staff often will kind of be the, the go-between, and they'll kind of, you know, they'll, they'll basically be the people who, they'll, when they receive these, they'll, they'll put them in the cleaning queue, and they'll get clean. The person who does this is Ellen Stafford. She runs the metals unit. Uh, her and her staff take care of these. They acid wash these bottles, um, put ultra-pure DI water in this one, the tubing gets washed and acid went, acid winced. That's a technical twin. Um, and, um, and yeah, so this is what you need. Uh, go ahead. You're also going to need um, 
some kind of a pump. Now, in the past, we used a vacuum pump to sort of suck the water through the filter. Those were inefficient, not so great, problematic. Anybody have any good words to say about the vacuum pump? Who's used them before in the past? Yeah, give you nice big Popeye muscles. But otherwise, they cause a lot of cuss words, and um, and, and occasionally just that you waste the filter because you know it gets plugged up. You can't use, or you know, just it gets like a vacuum lock or something. It's not really plugged up. Anyway, we moved on technology. We have uh, things like this. Uh, some of you may have other models that are you know, a little bit older, but they still, the, the function is the same. This pump head basically uses peristaltic motion, uses some special tubing, and pumps the water from one place to another. And it pumps it. The key thing is it pumps it through this filter, or one like this. This is a training filter. Um, the ones that you get will look a little bit different. They'll also have a, um, and I didn't bring it. You're going to see me struggle in a minute. This is a key thing here. This does come with the filters, um, which is very nice. You're going to see me. You're going to see why in a minute. All right, next slide. So, key things to remember: you are sampling for dissolved metals, where, or, or just metals in general. And we've got the instrumentation that we use um, gets down to pretty low levels. We're looking at you know, sub, you know, and, and some of these standards especially you folks in the mountains, because it's based on a hardness, how, how low is your hardness in the mountains? It's at the bottom, and sometimes it's below 25. So it's, if, if, you're, if the standard that you're trying to meet, the criteria, is based on a hardness, and if that hardness goes down, your criteria goes down as well. You're looking at very, very low. You can blow a standard very easily. So it's very critical that you take every single step in your uh, power, whatever, to um, Make sure that this stuff stays clean. So this is, this comes sealed up in this plastic bag, clean. Please keep it that way. And I'll keep kind of going over that. So you want to prepare your workstation with something. You need to have a, either a clean place, but what I recommend is just getting an old trash bag that doesn't want to come apart. And just laying it out. Sorry about the sound. I'm sure this sounds terrible on a microphone. Anyway, well, struggle. Get yourself a clean workspace. All right. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Don't let it flop around on the fill. So, yeah, get your pump, place it on your nice clean workspace. Next slide. Let's see. How am I doing? If you have a hose bar, put it on the inlet side. Make sure you rec you uh, look at this. This is pretty much invisible. I will pass this around later. Um, and mostly just for the folks who have not done this, seen this before. But there's a flow. It's pointing in this direction. Usually that is the case, that the sort of the, the little flange side here is kind of the, is the outlet. It's not always the case, so look and make sure you, make sure you know which way the flow is going. So obviously, you, since you're pushing water through, tubing on this side. Go ahead. Oh, actually, this is obviously for practice, but in real life, as I said, you want to keep this stuff clean. So wear some gloves. So. I will leave this uh, pump up here. I'll probably put it on that cart right there. Uh, depending on how much space we have, we may roll it somewhere else. But if you have not seen this before or have not used one of these, go ahead and come and take a look at it and just do this. You know, kind of load up the, the, the tubing itself. Make sure you understand it. You know, if you're not clear, this is the time to learn. Tubing it simply fits in just like this. And it just needs to be straight. Try to up here and demo it so that it's within you can kind of see these V's here this is much easier to do if you come look at it and then once it's straight and in there you just simply press it down it's ready to go so, next slide um, this basically just shows in picture form this might even be better than what I just showed you uh, so you know the tubing is just going to slot in here like this it's just a simple path go ahead next slide uh, it needs to go in those V's which are Kind of impossible to see on this, but go ahead, next slide, and then close it up. Next slide. All right. So, when you're doing this, be careful of these ends, because these ends are kind of what's going to be touching your sample, touching your filter. So, you know, I did that a little carelessly because I'm just trying to show you this, but in real life, you really want to be really cognizant of these. You want to put your filter on. 
you, you do want to do that, but I don't have one of those on this one, so you get to see me struggle. It can be done, but it's, um, um, it's a little painful. See, only in live television do you get to see people really struggle. So you can get it on there. Um, <laughs> if it were, uh, <laughs> it's not farm work, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. It's not a fuel filter for your tractor. But, um, so please don't spit on it. Um, I need to say that for the camera. It's in the official word, don't spit on it. Um, and the cool thing about this is, so you get a pretty good length. This is sort of an example one, but this is about uh, how much length you, we've cut the tubing to. So you can set up your workspace however you need. Um, give yourself plenty of tubing to fit into your, your cooler. Anyway, like I say, keep an eye on these ends. And the good thing about it is it comes in this bag. And so you can remove the bottles. And when you need to move away, step away, you don't have an extra hand, just put it in the clean bag and you're good to go. All right? So the first thing you need to do, next slide, is condition your filter. These filters, um, you know, previously, if you've done this in a long time ago in the past, we would collect what comes out of the, the first thing that comes out of the filter. We don't do that anymore. There, there's, no, there's not real, a lot of value in a filter blank, if you will. Because all this is is just, if you're going to do a field blank, do a field blank. What comes out of the filter is really just excess, whatever might be residing in this, this filter from the manufacturing process, and you're wetting the media. That's the purpose of doing this. So every time you get one of these kits, you've got a liter of water. You need to get rid of that liter of water. You get rid of it by filtering it through this, uh, running it through this filter. And <coughs> it's pretty simple. Again, making sure everything stays clean. Just put it into the, uh, the bottle. And all right. Make sure it's going the right direction. And pretty easy. What you want to do is, as it starts running through, you want to actually fill it from the bottom. And should be doing something like that. So that way, you, you, you know, you've got nothing but water in here. There's not a lot of air. You usually don't have much problem with these, but you just get better filtration, and everything just seems to warm better. Then just um, crank up your filter and let it roll. Uh, if you've got a place where you can just let it hang and it's not going to get dirty, it's fine by me. If you need to hold it, you need to hold it. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, question. Does that plug into, like, the power outlet in the car? It has a 12-volt. I'll show you when I'm done here. I'll show you what it looks like. And, you've, and again, I'll have this over here. You can look it over. You guys, every region should have one or two, if not more of these, um, of your own, because we're doing ambient monitoring of dissolved metals with them. So you've got some of these. In your region that you can just ask your, your monitor. Um, Dobie has them. He's got at least one. So I guess it advanced the slides, like kind of talk about it. So yeah, hold it up, right, keep going. Let it flow out, keep going. And then now that we're done, so we've emptied it. So let it, hold it upside down so that the air that's kind of being pushed through here pushes <laughs> the water through, but then you still kind of want to shake it and get all this excess. This is DI water. DI water, if it gets in your sample, will do what? It'll dilute it. You don't want this in your sample. So shake it, shake, 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 shake. All right. Turn it off. Now you need to go collect uh, water from the creek or the wherever. Handy dandy bag. Put your stuff in there. Keep it clean. I'm going to go over here and collect a sample. Fresh sample from Black Sink Creek. Can I stop you there? You bet. Okay, so um, that was nice that, that the sample was easily collected 14 feet away. But um, you know, Danny took me to school on Friday afternoon, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, it, you know, the reality of what I understand now that we've created in doing these standards, um, even more than I've understood, is that um, these guys are having to, uh, you know, truck a half a mile mm -hmm. through the woods to mm -hmm. get that sample. Mm -hmm. Okay, or more. Mm -hmm. 
right? So um, I think that one thing we need to think about now is that the sample is collected, and if this has to be set up on the back of the truck or mm -hmm. in a safe spot, um, how do we already have provisions in those sampling sheets to note that filtration didn't occur within 15 minutes because of location or because of uh, safety issues or whatever? Is that you? You certainly should note any deviation from standard operating procedure. Okay, that's yes. Any deviation that you do, you need to note it. And if that's if that's the reality of the situation, then that's what you can do. You I can do what you can do. And I think that it, we just need to make sure that it's, that it's noted. Um, I mean, Danny's concern was was you know with litigation or with any kind of penalties yep. that yep. somebody would immediately say that. But now the um, cool the one cool thing I'll, I'll just you know this runs off 12 volts. 12 volts is also a small battery. You can get a small 12 volt battery. This thing comes with a little uh, dongle that you can. Uh, I don't have it here and with me, but you can just slide it over. It's got a little, you know, 12 volt female thing to alligator clips, and you can put them on a small battery. This is not a huge, you know, it's, it's, we, we, we like this particular model, A, because it's cheap, cheaper than some of the others, and it's small, and it's sort of, and it's kind of rugged. Uh, you can put this in a backpack. Has this, you guys have done this right in Nashville? Or you, you guys have some of the other ones? Yeah, right. Battery around all the time. Yeah. I've never had any needs. Yeah, but it's, it, it is one of those things that is, it is possible to do this. And do it in the field. You know, you'll definitely want to take some some mats and things like that, some some sheeting that unfolds better than this trash bag, so that you can have a nice clean space. Uh, but it is it is definitely possible to do. Um, that said, sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes it's like you know, if you've got to hike three miles through very rugged terrain, no, you're not going to get back to. Um, you might not be able to to get everything done. So. But you, you still may get meaningful data. Yep. But have reading, you might know that there's possibly more there, but right. because the whole time is not met, you know, the number's lower than it actually should be. Right. Uh, again, the, the, the important thing is to note any deviation, and, you know, just be clear about what you're doing and what you're doing, and why. You know, if it's, yeah, if, it, if the situation's, you know, the weather, if it's flooding and you're just, it's just impossible to get a good sample, just note it. If, yeah, let the, let the lawyers figure it out. I mean, right. you, the, the important thing for you guys in the field is to make sure that you're safe, you're not doing anything, that, yeah, you're the most important. You know, I'm not saying it's because the safety guy walked in the room. It's, you've heard me say that hundreds of times. I, you know, it's like you guys really are the most important. If, it's, if the conditions are unsafe, don't, don't sample. It's, it's not worth it. But if you can get something, even if it deviates a little bit, um, let the lawyers figure it out. Again, if it's a if it's a really bad situation and it's going to go to litigation, if the you know if the metals are a hundred times the standard, it's still probably okay, even if it was collected, it wasn't preserved until two hours after the collection instead of one hour. But whatever you do, do not fabricate the data. Don't flub it. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that we're going we're going to talk about that later. Um, I don't want to steal all of Dana's thunder, but just you know make sure that what we a deviation from the norm is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no punitive action. If you can't get it, you're not going to be punished. So let's make that clear. All right. Um, so collect water from Black Sink Creek. Um, be sure to rent f uh, field rinse three times every time you get out of this thing. So you're not, I've ever had people ask me, but you're rinsing the acid out of this. That's exactly what you want to do. We don't want to collect acid from the laboratory. We want to collect stream water. So you want to be sure and rinse. So whatever's on the inside of this bottle, the inside, surfaces is based on the matrix that you're collecting, be it surface water, uh, groundwater, um, sludge, whatever it is. Make sure it's in there. So triple rinse it. And you're also going to want to triple rinse this stuff too. So um, next slide. Make sure I'm not missing anything. So the process is the same when it comes to your sample as it is with this conditioning water. You're basically just going to take your still clean, because you've kept it clean, tubing. Put it in there. You notice I kind of like to put it in a little bit more than it needs to because it, it's a little trick. It sort of keeps it, it keeps it in there because this thing is going to vibrate and it'll vibrate right out of your sample and onto the dirt. Don't let it do that. Right. Handy tips. See, now you're glad you came. Um, and again, and you have a speed control, most of them, so you can dial it down to make sure you don't, you know, cause a, a geyser. 
something like that. And in this case, you're just going to want to let about 100 mils or so, 150 mils of site water to go through your filter. You're essentially field rinsing. I kind of try to gauge it by how much is left in my bottle. That's about a good place right there. About, you know, I don't know, an inch down, something like that. Will everybody agree? Field collectors, let's jive with what you guys do. All right. Then, get yourself one of these handy dandy bottles. These have been uh, acid washed. They usually have an M on them or something like that to designate that they are special and not your regular old juice bottle. These have been cleaned by the staff in the lab. Um, be sure and thank them for the work they do when you see them. And then comes to actually collecting your sample. Now, this bottle also comes fresh from the, from the laboratory. It's not, uh, it needs to be field rinsed as well. So it needs to be rinsed just the same as the other ones. I like to do just something like this. You, just, you don't need very much water. If just the tiniest little bit can suffice for field rinse because you don't have a lot of water here. You need to be careful with it, especially if you just hiked, you know, 30 minutes to get it. You need to um, be careful with this stuff. So again, the way I like to do it, if you've got clean gloves and you can change your gloves if they, if they got dirty in any way, is just to essentially kind of hold it like this. So that's way you've got an extra hand because as you're doing this, you'll realize you kind of need three hands. So. Anyway, do this three times. And then, once you've done it three times, just simply fill her up. Pretty easy speezy. need about this much roughly of you know, this is this is the best this is ideal you can probably get away with a little bit less if you run out but we want to have it this needs to be at least half to two-thirds full in order for them to get a good sample um, and then the last thing you need to do is preserve with nitric acid this is not real nitric acid this is just an old one but Simply just dunk, preserve it. This needs to be filtered and preserved um, within 15 minutes of collection, according to EPA guidance. So keep that in mind. If you're going to be hiking out, it's going to take you 20 minutes to get back. You might want to hike in with a pump and all that stuff so you can do it all there. Go ahead and advance. I can't remember what it is. Okay, yeah, then when you're done, um, you can, uh, this, this filter is trash. You can, I'm gonna, you can filter the water, you can pump the water out. Just pump it, let the pump do it, and get it out of there. Or just chuck it in the trash, it, do, it doesn't matter. It's just, it's just, it's waste now. This is, these are single use filters. Um, I'll probably use this one again for training, but, um, but they're, they're single use, so just chuck them in the trash. The, you're gonna have a full bottle. You're gonna, I'll tell you in a minute what to do with this other bottle. Um, this, if you got extra sight water, just dump it out. You don't need it because you've already done your collection. Take this, your tubing that is filthy and dirty from the water that you ran through it. Put it back in the bag and put this in your cooler. Put this in your cooler with your samples. Um, the laboratory knows what to do with these. They know that when they see these, they know that they're dirty and they need to be cleaned and they'll go in the queue and then Ellen will wash them, bag them back up, send them back to the regions. We'll have them in about a week. Now, um, when you collect dissolved metals, you're going to have to collect two for every, every time. Um, you, these are single use only, so that means can you use this filter again? For the second one, no. You have to pitch this one and use another. So everything gets a whole new kit. So you have to have a whole other one of these to get going. So, any questions? How much does this cost? About anywhere from fifteen to eighteen dollars, depending on um, 
each. They're expensive. Don't waste these. Don't lose them. Don't, uh, don't, you know, don't use them to filter your coffee water. Yeah, they're, they're very expensive. Uh, they do add up. So that actually brings a good point. Uh, for regional office staff, so, you know, uh, currently we buy a lot of filters here for ambient monitoring. Um, for regional office staff, if you need to go do a few, you know, you need to get an emergency, uh, you, need to, you need to borrow some filters. Um, you need to borrow three, four, five, something like that, take them, it's fine. We're happy to help. If you're gonna do 50, if you got a, a project where you're gonna have to do a lot of dissolved metal sampling, please buy your own. Please don't, you know, because it's $800 for a box of those things, and that obviously will add up quickly. So please buy your own. You guys have budgets, use them. All right. Um, all right. What to do with this bottle? So as you may have noticed in those kits, it comes with two juice bottles. This is for your total metals. Every time you go collect dissolved metals, you should collect total metals as well, at least one. And I'm going to go ahead and tell everybody here who's not ambient monitoring, go ahead and collect two. Um, go ahead and collect two because it's better to collect, collect more and decide you don't need it than to have it not. Go ahead. So Brian, what's the shelf life of those filters? Uh, honestly, I don't know. We have quite a few of them. Um, I, I, years, years, years. If you wet them, if you get them wet, so when I worked at the USGS, we would sometimes we would pre-condition our filters. So in the morning or the night, bef the day before, we would actually run the DI through, so we could uh, it would just be a lot faster. You can do that, but it's it's 24 hours after that point. Once it's wet, it's 24 hours, and you need to keep it sealed in a bag like this. So you pull it out of a bag, you can wet it, kind of get it ready, empty it out as best as you can, shake the snot out of it and then uh, put it back in a, in a Ziploc bag like this and keep it there until you use it. Um, yeah, but total metals, you do have to collect the total metal sample. And total metals is how do you collect the total metals? Just dip in the water. Or however you collect, you know, bridge sampler, dip it in the water, rinse it three times, and preserve with nitric acid. Go ahead. So. Again, and this is something that I, I know a lot of you have heard several times from Connie, me, others at all, is that anytime you collect a dissolved metal sample, we have to do it with, what we, our, our standards are based on two things, acute and chronic. What we do generally do here for, for ambient monitoring is acute, where we collect two. And they must be collected 15 minutes apart and within an hour of one another. 15 minutes apart is easy because it takes you about 15 minutes to kind of get all your stuff filtered and then reconditions another filter and do a lot of stuff. 15 minutes is easy, getting 15 minutes apart. Getting within an hour can be challenging if you have to go very, f if you have to go far to go get another sample. So that's where maybe you got to hump it in. Um, we can talk about chronic, um, but that's, there's, that's more complex than, we've talked about the chronic stuff before. That's sort of a, across that bridge when we get there kind of thing. That's where I'm going to leave that. Uh, each sample gets its own metal kit, as I, as I mentioned. So each one gets a whole new filter. So, you know, if you're, if you're doing math in your head, yeah, you know, if you've got to do a bunch of dissolved metals, uh, it's going to add up. It's going to get expensive really quick just in supplies. That's not even counting the lab analysis. So um, not to say it's not worth it, but just remember the cost that's going into this. Make sure that what you're doing and how you're, you make sure you're following these protocols, make sure you're staying as clean as possible because there's nothing more expensive than bad data. Clear on that? Like screwing it up is, it's, it's way worse to come back on another day than to get bad data. Um, again, before uh, there was a practice of collecting the, the water that used to, the, basically the filter, the blank water that came out of your filter. If you're collecting a field blank, that's a whole other story. But if you're just, the, the conditioned water, don't collect it, it's not necessary. Um, you should be collecting field blanks if you're doing a study. You should be collecting field blanks. Uh, roughly about 5% of every site, not just metal sites. Um, we can talk about field blanks at another time. Uh, and then skip to the next one. So this is sort of, if you're in an area where it's very windy, you got a lot of dust, especially in an agricultural or maybe you're next to a highway, Highway dust is full of metals. You know, think about all the brakes, brake dust and all that stuff that comes <coughs> off and just metals just in general that comes off cars. Um, 
if you're in a place like that and you can't get into an enclosed place, closed space, um, like a truck or a van or something like that, that's where I recommend if you can get into a van and close, the, close, it, close it up a little bit so that you're not being affected by all that airborne dust, that's a good place to, to process your samples. If not, you may want to try to construct something like this where you basically you can make something out of PVC pipe, um, make a little, basically just a little square, and it's, it's very, <coughs> very easy to do, um, and then just simply get a clear trash bag, something like this, and kind of wrap it around your, that, this, this square frame and work underneath it. Is this a pain to work with? Yes, yes it is, especially when it's windy and it's blowing all over the place. Um, but does it give you good data? Yes, it can. It can really help. Because, again, we point out that these are, um, uh, we're, we're talking about, you know, some, especially in the mountains and out west, these, the standards that you're trying to compare this data to can be so low because the hardness is low that it, it, any little bit of just airborne anything can, can blow it. So you need to be careful. Keep it clean. I think that's about it I have for normal stuff. Any questions, any concerns that folks who have been doing this for a long time, any comments about how it works? Those that haven't, any questions about the how or the why? Let it rip. The two talk about mm -hmm. we only have one latch on that. What's that? We only have one label on a latch. You said something about grabbing two. That's for us, just, let's just hold off on that. We're still, we're still working through it. I tell the people in the regional staff, if you're going to do an emergency work, collect two just in case. It's better to collect them. You really just, just collect two for everybody else. If you're, if you're in ambient monitoring, just do as assigned. We may end up, we're, it's still under discussion, we may end up going to two total metals. Um, I still haven't, we need to talk um, about whether or not that's going to happen. It might, or you just got to, all you got to do is just dip it and. Um, grab another acid. So, yes, John. Uh, the question for the people that are already running this: um, what you know, what's troubling you, or what's not working great with the methods? Um, you got any feedback for Brian? And, uh, is it going swimmingly, or is it not? And that's both for the ambient monitoring and in uh, incident response. Connie talked a little bit about the problems with just getting into some of these locations. Any more to add on that? I, I, I know that Brett. You can speak more to this, James, if you know more than I do. But I know he's he's done some stuff with where he's had to hump in quite a ways. And they have, in Nashville, they have some, they're a little bit different. They actually come with sort of a battery pack. They're the big yellow ones. Um, and they're kind of nice because they're sort of a, you can put them in a backpack pretty easily, put your bottles in, and, and, and you're good to go. The one good thing about this, and so we do want you to chill them before they get to the laboratory. but um, they keep them on ice, but it's not really, they, when, when they get them in the lab, refrigeration is not required for metals. If they're preserved, they're preserved. And they have a really nice long hold time. What is it? It's almost like six months or something crazy. I can't remember exactly what it is, but that's one good thing about them. Um, but I think maybe to answer your question, if I could, or just start a little bit larger discussion is that what you've seen me do here, I've given this talk a couple of times. To, you know, some of you, this is your second or third time hearing this. This is about what, you know, this is kind of what we can do to, to help you guys, you know, show you the how. But there's a lot of things with regional office operations and, and, and um, you know, response, emergency, stuff like that. I don't know. I don't know what you guys should be doing. Um, and I think it's, this is sort of the broader discussion. I'm sure we'll go over this tomorrow, tomorrow morning about, how best, how best can, we, can, we, can we do anything to help you guys more? Have we exhausted the level of what we can do in terms of training? And do we need to try to work on other ways of getting you guys up to speed with some of the 
special situations that you guys deal with. It's not just a simple, I mean, it's just, here's the easy creek. You know, I know all creeks are not easy, but um, anyway, I'll open it up to more thoughtful discussion. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do it often enough, it's easy to forget the, the minor details. Should we be doing more? Should should you guys have uh, buy pizza for the monitors and and uh, have them do the? Pra have you guys practice? Like you know, get, go down to the lab and break break this out and let everybody kind of give it a whirl. And I mean, Bucket Creek is always flowing. I'm serious. That's a. Right. So. What was the question? There's, there wasn't a. a, a Asheville and Raleigh, uh, got to see our, our road show, which was kind of a, um, it was it was me, and the QA coordinator and Chris Van Laurel, and we would go and we basically would kind of cover this and a few other things. It was just a, a day long event where in the morning we talked about some of the same things we're going to talk about this today and, and tomorrow. And then in the afternoon we broke everybody out into uh, groups to do hands-on stuff. It was kind of a thing where we dreamt it up, we, we, we hoped it would be a um, um, kind of an annual thing where we would go or you would somehow get some refresher, maybe we'd use some video podcasts, something like that to get, basically have an annual training. Um, we had a vacancy for a little while, and that kind of got uh, hoodwinked for, for a bit. We, we, we had to put it down. Uh, now that David's back, maybe we can bring it back up again. You folks that, so Danny, you're the, uh, did you guys find it helped? Do you think it helped your staff enough? Was it, um, yeah, was it thorough enough? Do you think it could be better augmented by <coughs> more of a regional approach, maybe somebody from the regions who could? Bring it in. Yeah, I think it was it was thorough enough. I think like on um, meter calibration, like one of the things we do in the Raleigh region is we try to have all the staff exposed to how to how to calibrate meters because everybody's apt to have to go deal with a school bit, mm -hmm. um, or a fish bill or whatnot. So um, so we try to have some kind of reoccurring meter training and sampling training, mm -hmm. be it internal or more formal with y'all present. But it's one of those things that you kind of keep revisiting because you get this drip and staff turnover um, just just on the basic kind of filling out sheets and filling out the chain of custody, that kind of thing. So we try to keep revisiting it and it's kind of, um, and some staff are, have much more comfort with it than others. So we just keep, keep re revisiting and training on it. So okay. we, we try to do it minimally once a year and then when, I was, when there's a bit going on, we try to assign staff to folks that have more experience than they are. That's what we do. Would, uh, I guess, you know, did, did what, we, what we did, did it fit your bill? Did it sort yeah. of cover what the basis of what you guys <coughs> it, it need did. to do? Okay. It did. It, uh, I think it reinforced stuff with some staff that have um, that had experience with it and experience with the monitoring and kind of um, was a good introduction to folks that did not have that experience okay. and then uh, got them where they would better be able to reach out and ask, for, ask questions and get trained on okay. from, from Rick and other folks. So that, that's my take on it. So you'd recommend it again yeah. and for other regions as well. So it's not like, and if you have any, please share any Things that you might want to yeah, add. I think there's there's some things that I'm learning from the standpoint of doing the dissolved metal and sampling during events. If you're sampling waste stream that's going to have high hardness, you need to probably do chronic um, sampling because um, you'll have more metal standard violations than you would if you if you don't do that. I suspect. Okay. Um, and the other thing is um, just. Silly stuff like you got to take a hardness, or you're not going to get be able to do anything with your data. Um, um, you're going to have to do that kind of stuff, and that's the kind of things staff have to learn when they're getting ready to go sample or, or right. in the field. And remember that the, the, the hardness can actually come out of the total sample volume. 
Yeah. Right. So it's just a matter of making sure it's checked. And even if you don't check it, um, Roy should have that data because it's here in what you're running in the lab. So it, it's just you know it's just a matter of making sure that somebody understands why you want to do and why you need the total amount right. of sample. This is complex. I mean, I've been listening and you know since day one when I started and trying to figure this stuff out, I still get confused. Wait, it's a you know, this, the, what standards what? Like, I, I, it's always. We've had three, three different incidences where we sampled it from a spill event that the hardness was well over 400. Yeah. So, um, so it's not just ambient stream samples. Right. So, um, that's that's some things I was surprising that you're kind of learning that. There's, there's some I'm curious why why would you use a chronic in that case? Maybe help me because I don't. Well, in this case, it, it, it is a chronic event. Right. I mean, the situation that we're dealing with is going to be long term. Okay. It's not, it didn't just happen. Right? Is this the uh, is this the leech from yeah. the uh, the yeah. so it mulch? Is long, long okay. Term. But but one of the things that we ran into there was yeah. having an upstream sample to recognize how the spill actually changed the hardness of the water. Right. I mean, it, the water isn't naturally hard, and then there was this, this leachate. It, the leachate is changing the conditions of the water. So right. it was very complex. And um, and again, this is not what we tried to deal with when we wrote these rules. Right. So, um, that, I mean, and, that, and Danny's very much right that you know we need to figure out how to handle these situations. And uh, then, of course, in dealing with that, if we have other similar situations just in, with ambient um, issues, then the team here that we've got that did, that deals with planning and baseline assessment needs to realize that this is going to be challenging as well. Red and aluminum and, and iron. So, 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 so there's that. They had a beneficial fill site with coal ash um, to add, you know, productivity of like 2,700, you know, it was, and this. so that, that was an, another one. And then we had a, uh, a CPRO, which is a pesticide company, doing test trials on a grid, and they're trying to and then do water out of their ponds. But they're, the bottom of their ponds have solids in them and lots of copper, and the, mm -hmm. and the hardness is really high. So it's just trying to figure out what, what's going on with the metals and that. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't actually know. Uh, but, but at any rate, the hardness is really elevated. So, yeah, I wouldn't have originally thought that the that leachate would be a problem for dissolved metals. It's not one of the things that would originally hit me, but, you know, it lowered the pH so much that yeah. it liberates, you know, you think back to your way back to machine to your redox chemistry of metals. <coughs> um, you know, yeah, lower EH pH diagram, if you always remember that from geochemistry class. Yeah, you, you liberate all sorts of things when the pH gets lower and you have. Um, so, yeah, anyway. I have a question for you, Ron. Yep. Have you encountered or has it ever come up of uh, metal constituents in a powder coating on your trash bags? And or how do you know if you're buying completely powder free bags? Good question. Um, no, I have not seen that. I mean, I see it on um, gloves, but I don't know. I don't know if a manufacturer that specifies this is a powder-free bag. No, but great question. Uh, the thing you need to do, make sure you're doing, is field blanks uh, from time to time, doing regular field blanks. And if you do get hits, that's when it's time to stop and figure out where it's coming from. And that you kind of have to get a little bit more complex and do equipment blank. You got to take it into its individual pieces. You do a field like just on the filter, then you do it on the, the tubing and the, and the bottles, and you do it on, yeah, you have to kind of get, you start getting into equipment like things to, to hunt down the source, and that can be a little complex and expensive, but worth the while, yeah. yeah the, the lab's happy to do any sort of source testing for yep. you. If you buy a box of, you know, trash bags, is that what you're talking about? Yep. Um, you know, go ahead and soak it in some water or something and send it to us just as a sample and mm -hmm. test that for you. Yep. They do, um, the laboratory does do tests on the, you know, the, the acid that they use, the preservative, 
Um, I believe they do tests on the, the bottles from time to time, but um, it's still up to you guys really to do, you know, when you're designing a study, do field blanks. Uh, you can just get blank, you know, the laboratory will provide you with blank water uh, that you can use to do that stuff. But treat it just like you would a regular sample. So, you know, after you've conditioned your filters, then you run DI through it. You run DI through your filter and run it, treat it exactly like you would a sample. Triple rinse it and everything. Tr treat it exactly like you would. You do it. We do blanks for volatiles already. Uh, that's required, and for mercury. But for other things, it's not necessarily required for the method, but it is good sampling practice. And you want to do it at least one out, one out of every 20. And if you're only doing 10, you should at least do one. Gloves are important because things mm -hmm. like personal care products, mm -hmm. lotions, and um, yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. can contribute as well. So. And when it comes to just, I mean, we are looking at hardness too, calcium and magnesium. You know, that's a, just a general mineral that you, you might, if you're sw if it's a sweaty day, if you've got beads of sweat dripping into your, your sample, that's not good either. There's, I don't know what kind of minerals are in your sweat. I don't really care to know, but. Um, <laughs> You know, just be cognizant, you know, wear the, the sweatbands, it makes you look cooler.